Prior to 2018, there was considered to be just one truly wild horse species left in the world. Chowalski's horse is one of the rarest equids, having recently made a comeback from near extinction. A review made in 2022 estimates there are currently 2,500 individuals in captivity and around 900 in the wild, a significant improvement from just a few decades ago. In the late 1960s, these animals were declared extinct in the wild, existing only in captivity. Thanks to significant conservation efforts, herds were reintroduced to the steppe in Central Asia and the populations that exist there today can be found in small, isolated pockets in Mongolia and China. Herds are led by a dominant stallion and contain multiple females and their young, a social structure known as a harem. As with most equids, gestation lasts around 11 to 12 months and mares usually give birth to a single foal in the spring. Young can stand and walk within an hour of birth, but won't become independent for 8 to 13 months. When it was first assessed, Chowalski's horse was given full species status and then changed to the same species as the domesticated horse. A 2018 study published in Science now argues that these animals are actually the feral descendants of some of the earliest domesticated horses used by the Bowtie culture of Central Asia around five and a half thousand years ago, suggesting there are in fact no truly wild horses remaining today. Regardless of its status, Chowalski's horse shares the wild with many spectacular feral horses, along with six or seven other species, all of which we'll explore in this video, on a journey that takes us through Africa, Europe, Asia and Australia, before culminating in the Americas. With horses playing such a crucial role in the development of civilization, what better place to start than the beloved domesticated horse? Despite their variety, the 300-some breeds of domestic horse are all classified as a single species. Breeds are created over many generations by selectively mating horses with similar desirable traits to create animals that excel in specific ways. Draft horses are bred for their size, power and strength and played a crucial role in early industry. In fact, the term horsepower was coined in the 18th century by Scottish inventor and engineer James Watt as a marketing tactic to compare the output of his steam engines to that of the highly popular draft horse. Today, the Shire horse is often considered the largest breed with the tallest on record, an individual born in 1848 known as Mammoth, measuring 21.2 hands high from the ground to the withers or the tallest part of the back. Each hand equates to four inches, making Mammoth well over seven feet or two meters tall, not including his undoubtedly massive neck and head. On the other end of the scale, ponies are much smaller and are actually defined by their size. Any member of this species under 14.2 hands high is considered a pony, although this doesn't appear to be strictly adhered to as we'll discover later on. Like draft horses, ponies are also bred for their strength and thanks to their smaller stature can be used in situations where a larger draft horse is not appropriate, in addition to requiring a lot less food. A feral horse refers to an individual found in the wild but of domestic lineage. Though Africa is home to all three species of zebra, there is just one feral horse population found in the most surprising location. The Namib Desert encompasses Namibia's entire coastline, and it is to the south of this region we are headed. This desert exhibits some of the lowest levels of rainfall on Earth, and is often cited as one of the world's driest places. It is surprising then that Africa's only population of feral horses exist quite happily here, despite the conditions. The origin of these horses is subject to debate, but most theories center around German colonialism. At the start of World War I, Germany held several colonies in Africa, one of which was in modern-day Namibia. Around the same time, diamonds were discovered in the country, leading to huge restricted areas that were inaccessible to hunters and horse traders. Today, the vulnerable herd consists of just over a hundred individuals under the threat of predation, chiefly from clans of spotted hyenas targeting their foals. 
In 2012, the Namibia Wild Horses Foundation was established to protect these horses, and they have become a popular tourist attraction for those exploring the endless wildlife of the African continent, including our first species of zebra. The mountain zebra is found in two distinct ranges on the southern tip of Africa. Namibia and Angola are home to one subspecies, Hartmann's mountain zebra, while South Africa hosts the other, the Cape mountain zebra. The latter is by far the rarest, although arguably the most well known. Of the roughly 35,000 mountain zebras, just 2 to 3,000 belong to the Cape variety, and they benefit from heavy protection in a dedicated national park. Cape Mountain Zebra National Park was founded specifically for the protection of this subspecies. It is relatively small, covering an area of just 65 square kilometers, and houses around 350 mountain zebras, which are classified as vulnerable. Although it is not uncommon for zebras to exhibit chestnut areas in their coats, this coloration appears to be particularly prevalent in Cape Mountain Zebras, who often feature a beautiful gradient of chestnut to black in the stripes around their muzzle. It should be noted this difference in coloration is based on my observation and isn't usually listed as a defining feature. More conventional traits include a fold of loose skin on the neck known as a dewlap, stripes that terminate on the side producing a white belly, and thinner, more numerous stripes when compared to our next species of zebra. The plain zebra is often cited as the smallest species of zebra, weighing up to 850 pounds and standing no more than 5 feet at the shoulder. This puts them in the same size category as the largest ponies or the smallest horses. Its claim to fame is the longest terrestrial migration in Africa, a journey that is only undertaken by some individuals at the southern end of their range and was discovered relatively recently in 2014. The migration takes place in southern Africa between the floodplains of the Chobe River in Namibia, where they spend the dry season, and Naipan National Park in Botswana. The journey measures 150 miles in each direction, making it longer than the wildebeest migration when measured in a straight line. Migration is undertaken in large herds, but this is not indicative of everyday life for the zebra. They are more commonly found in harems, comprising one to six females and their young, and the dominant stallion. The plain zebra is the most common of the three species and also has the largest range, being found throughout southern Africa and the eastern portion of the continent, as far north as South Sudan and Ethiopia. They are also the least endangered, with somewhere between 150 to 250,000 remaining in the wild which is less than can be said for our final zebra species. Grevy zebra is the rarest of the three species. They are classified as endangered with just under 2,000 individuals when they were last assessed in 2016. They are also the largest of the zebras, with adults weighing up to 1,000 pounds, and can also be distinguished by their stripes. The Grevy zebra exhibits the thinnest stripes, which are particularly noticeable on the head, and like those of the mountain zebra, do not wrap around onto the belly, leaving it entirely white. As to the function of zebra stripes, a 2019 study published in the Journal of Experimental Biology sought to back up the theory that zebra stripes function to reduce tabernid or horsefly bites. Scientists initially observed that captive zebras received less bites than horses in the same field, despite the number of flies circling above the animals being the same. Horses were then given different coloured cloth coats, and it was observed that those who wore coats with stripes experienced less flies landing on them than those who wore coats of a solid colour. It was therefore concluded that striped surfaces inhibit the fly's ability to land, leading to lower bite rates and reduced disease transmission. Grevy zebra is found in Kenya and Ethiopia, along with the only other species to at least partially exhibit the captivating striped pattern. The African wild ass is the first of four species that we'll cover in the subgenus Asinus, whose members are known commonly as asses or wild asses. The African wild ass may contain two subspecies, the possibly extinct Nubian wild ass and the more common, although still critically endangered, Somali wild ass, which will be the focus of this section. 
at no more than 550 pounds. This species is the smallest of the asses and survives in the harsh, arid conditions of northern Ethiopia and Eritrea. They breed once per year during the summer and like other equids share close bonds between the female members of the group. Some female foals remain with their herd their entire lives, whereas males are forced out by the dominant stallion at around one year of age. This species is considered by some to include the domesticated donkey, but this status is debated by others, so for the purpose of this video, like the domesticated horse, we'll discuss it as a separate species. Although donkeys are generally considered less powerful than horses, they are thought of as more patient, with a calmer temperament and live longer lives, making them highly dependable and better suited for many jobs. While donkeys form close bonds with members of their herd, they are highly territorial, much more so than horses. This trait is said to be derived from their roots in Africa. On the Asian steppe where horses descend from, food is plentiful, there is less competition for resources and social groups tend to be larger. In an arid desert environment, food is scarce, competition is higher and social groups tend to be smaller. Thanks to this lineage, donkeys also fare better than horses in hotter, more arid environments. Like horses, donkeys are also bred for specific traits, resulting in a wide range of breeds, including the Poitou from France. This breed was developed specifically for producing mules, the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. Due to the difference in species, mules are infertile, but exhibit the strength and stamina of a horse, combined with the robust, calm qualities of a donkey, also requiring less food and living longer lives. Heading out of Africa, the Asiatic wild ass is found in small, isolated ranges across Central Asia, and thanks to its four distinct subspecies, is also known as the onager or the kulan. Like their African counterparts, the Asiatic wild ass is often found in arid or semi-arid environments, and their range is dependent on the proximity to a water source. At no more than 5 feet at the shoulder, they are roughly the same height as a plain zebra, but are lighter, weighing no more than 570 pounds. Among the subspecies, the Persian onager exhibits intriguing mating behaviour. Males who often live alone defend a territory which groups of females will either migrate between or inhabit for life. Onagers and other subspecies also form harems, and even larger groups can occur, particularly near a water source. In the winter, if their environment demands it, their coat thickens to stave off the cold, and their appearance becomes more similar to our last species of wild ass found to the east. The Tibetan wild ass was once considered a subspecies of Asiatic wild ass, but is now defined as a distinct species. It is the largest of the wild asses, weighing up to a thousand pounds, which is around the same size as a grevy zebra. These equids are found exclusively on the high altitude grasslands of the Tibetan Plateau, at elevations between 13,000 to 23,000 feet. Their fur is darker and thicker than that of the onaga, equipping them well for the cold Tibetan winters. Group size can be as small as four, or as large as hundreds of individuals, led by an older female. It is the only wild equid species listed as least concern, with a stable population of 60 to 70,000 individuals when it was last assessed in 2015. Breeding takes place between August and September, and while weaning is usually complete at around one year of age, maturity won't be reached for another 12 months. Predators include the grey wolf and the snow leopard, whose range is also centred around the Tibetan Plateau. Roughly 5,000 kilometres to the west, the Anatolian Plateau may be smaller, but is home to its own collection of free-roaming equids. The Yilka horses of Cappadocia have a fascinating story, deep-seated in local tradition, dating back many hundreds of years. I could find several explanations for the word Yilka, suggesting it either means last years or derives from an older Turkish word meaning left to the wild. Both of these explanations support the story that these horses were once used by the locals during spring, summer and fall to plough their fields before being left to fend for themselves during the winter. 
the horses would be rounded up again in the spring and used until harvest. This practice slowly began to die out with the introduction of modern farming equipment, which left the horses with, quite literally, free reign of the countryside. Today, some of these horses are looked after by the locals, hence the rain seen on some individuals, and are a popular tourist attraction alongside Cappadocia's picturesque hot air balloon rides. A short journey through the Mediterranean Sea brings us to a beautiful region in the south of France. The Camargue is home to a wide range of incredible animals, not least of which is a population of aquatically inclined equids. The white horses of Camargue are about as spectacular as it gets and are referred to as semi-feral. These animals live in the marshes of the Rhone Delta but are still used today, most notably by the local cattle herdsmen known as Le Gardien. They are considered to be one of the oldest horse breeds in the world. Archaeological evidence suggests they are the descendants of an extinct wild horse known as the Solutre, which was hunted in the region during the Stone Age. At between 13 to 14 hands high, the Camargue horse is relatively small and develops its white coat with age. Foals are born between April and July and are brown in colour. Over the next five to seven years, this coat slowly develops into their adult coloration, which although it appears white, is generally considered a shade of grey. A one hour drive northeast brings us across the border and into the German town of Dulmen. The Dulmina is most well known for its dark grey coloration, but also displays various shades of brown. This breed is quite small, averaging between 12 to 13 hands, and like those in the Camargue, have a close relationship with the locals. The earliest mention of the Dulmina dates back to the 14th century, when they were mentioned in land acquisition documents. Over the centuries their territory has shrunk, and they are now found in a small herd numbering 300 individuals on a nature reserve measuring 400 hectares or around 4 square kilometres. Being such a small area for so many stallions, each year on the last Saturday in May, the horses are rounded up and some of the young stallions are separated and sold off, an event that attracts up to 15,000 people per year. To continue our journey into the feral horses of Europe, we need to travel roughly 750 kilometers to Britain's southwest peninsula. Exmoor refers to an area of moorland in southwest England, which is home to around 350 ponies. They are said to be the oldest native pony breed in Britain, with a recorded history of almost 1,000 years. The first mention of these animals dates back to 1085, when William the Conqueror commissioned a book known as the Doomsday Book which contains the results of a giant land survey. Over the centuries, the ponies became quite popular and the Exmoor Pony Society was founded in 1921 to preserve the breed. After almost dying out during World War II, herds were re-established and today around 500 ponies are found in Exmoor National Park, split between 21 herds and many more exist around the world. The ponies that live on the moorland today do roam freely, but all of them have owners, including two herds that belong to the national park. A short hop across the North Atlantic takes us to Iceland, where the horses are just as stunning as the landscape. The Icelandic horse is another small breed, measuring 13 to 14 hands, but is referred to as a horse rather than a pony. Its history on the island dates back to the days of the Vikings, and is thought to have arrived in Iceland around the 9th century on the boats of the Nordic settlers. Like those on Exmoor, the horses in Iceland do appear to be wild, but the majority of these animals have owners and are used for a variety of purposes. The Icelandic horse is referred to as a gated breed, exhibiting additional modes of locomotion above the traditional walk, trot and gallop. Somewhat akin to having more gears on a bicycle, these additional traits can make for a smooth ride, and as such, gated breeds are particularly popular for riding. Those from Iceland are highly sought after, and thankfully far from extinction. Roughly 80,000 horses reside on the island, and an additional 100,000 around the world. 
Once a horse has left Iceland, it cannot return, and Icelandic law also prevents other horses from being imported, resulting in a pure breed with low disease rates and no need for vaccinations. While the horses in Iceland date back some 1,000 years, those on the Australian continent have a much more recent story. While the human occupation of Australia dates back over 50,000 years, horses wouldn't set foot on the continent until the arrival of the British in 1788. According to popular law, one of the settlers was a farrier named James Brumby, and so the story goes, it was some of his horses that were left to roam the Australian countryside, and his name by which they are now referred. Their population is estimated to be around 400,000, and is so large that in parts of Australia these horses are actually thought of as pests and are subject to culling by local authorities. Nevertheless, the horse is an important part of Australian culture and is one of the most striking on this list, exhibiting a wide range of sizes and colours, thanks largely to their mixed heritage from breeds such as the thoroughbred and Arabian. Our journey to the Americas is unfortunately brief, but is set against some of the world's most incredible scenery. The wild horses of Patagonia have a very similar story to their Australian counterparts. There are tales of horses brought to the continent by the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century, and being relatively new to the region, they are also considered invasive, with local authorities calling for their removal. A horse or bovine that has become feral in this part of the world is known as bagual, making these horses collectively referred to as baguales. Today, they number just a few hundred, with around a hundred of them located in Torres del Paine National Park. The final stop on our journey brings us to the United States, where one of the most iconic horses abides. The Mustang also traces its origins to Spanish colonialism and derives its name from the Spanish term mesteño, referring to animals with no owner, or more dramatically as a stray or ownerless beast. Wild horses did exist in the Americas before this period, but evidence suggests that they died out around 9000 BC. Like other feral horses with colonial heritage, the Mustang has crossbred over the years and exhibits traits of many different breeds. During the centuries following the arrival of the Spanish, these horses were captured and sold both as working horses or for their meat, as well as being used by Native American tribes to hunt buffalo, among other uses. Populations of these feral horses increased, reaching a record high in 1918 of around 2 million individuals. Since then, numbers have reduced significantly, with recent estimates suggesting around 70,000 Mustangs remain in the grasslands of the western United States, including Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, which you can learn about in this video, covering 21 US national parks. Thank you so much for watching.